Monks are one of the strongest classes in Baldur's Gate, able to dish out tons of damage, but what if we took that formula and sprinkled in some rogue and stealthy mechanics? In this video today, I want to walk through my Ninja Assassin build for Baldur's Gate 3. We'll combine a lot of the great critical striking gear in the game and the Assassin subclass of the rogue with a lot of the mobility functions of the Shadow Monk subclass from Monk to make for a really fun, thematic, and strong ninja character that can reach any opponent on the battlefield. Just a heads up, I know that Tavern Brawler is the super min-max way to play the Monk in BG3, but we won't be touching that feat here. I find that playing the same class in the distilled ways that the internet constantly pressures you into playing just detracts from the innate fun of the game. Besides, we'll be using Monk weapons in this build anyway, so it won't work regardless. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. So with that being said, this build is pretty straightforward. We'll be taking seven levels of Monk as the Shadow Monk subclass, and then five levels in to rogue with assassin you can split those up if you want but i think it's fine to go straight into seven monk levels for your mobility spell at level seven as well as extra attack at level five and then five levels into uh, assassin after that you could do five into monk three into assassin then two more into monk and the final two into assassin but both routes will work just fine but that's really the too long didn't watch of this entire video and if that's all you wanted to know then please feel free to shut down the video and start assassinating samurai in the garden with this gardening tool before you head out please don't forget to like comment subscribe each one of those things does help me out in a huge way i've gone from like 89 percent to 80 percent unsubscribed viewership because of your help but that's a number i'd still like to get lower and every little bit helps if you need help with any other subject in Baldur's gate 3 check out my playlist link below and also check me out on twitch I will be covering tons of Dragon's Dogma too, so you can find all that on Twitch here whenever I'm going to start doing it. But let's get started here on my Ninja Assassin build for Baldur's Gate 3. Jumping into character creation, let's take a look at how we can approach this ninja. Now, there are plenty of races that you can go with. Remember, this is a single-player narrative-based game, so choose whatever makes the most sense for you. You can have fun with this in any way you want. Don't do whatever the internet tells you is the best or whatever. So with that being said, though, there are some good standout options when it comes just to stealthing in general into this game. Um, halflings, for example, or the gnomes, specifically, of course, uh, I believe this, yeah, gnome cunning has there, but specifically, of course, like the deep gnome, which is going to give you advantage to stealth a check. Stealth a check, like a, like a Mario? What the hell's wrong with me? Uh, but when you go to the Lightfoot Halfling, Lightfoot Halfling also has advantage to stealth check. So taking these two smaller races is going to make stealthing a little bit easier for you. I also am a big fan of just Drow in general in any playthrough of the game because it's my favorite race. So I'm going to be biased towards them. Um, another thing, since this is going to be a melee character using melee weapons, I also really like Half Orc because of Savage Attacks. When you land a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, you deal an extra dice of weapon damage. That's going to be very good for you since you will be using that in your character um anything else though is of course good and great i like the gith because gith are really thematic for the monk so i think that this is a really cool one if you have never made a gith in the game it's important to note that you get a ton of really fun crispy narrative options that you wouldn't have gotten from any other race and i think it's a really cool kind of like how the drow has access to a whole ton as well um, some other cool ones, though, are tieflings. I'm always a big fan of tieflings. I like their natural resistance to fire. And depending upon which one you take, I would say maybe Asmodeus or Mephistopheles tiefling over the Zariel tiefling. Just because of the innate spells, and I guess you could say cantrips, but innate spells that they get access to. What you do have to kind of consider here, though, is since you're playing a monk, you will only have weapon proficiencies of simple weapons and short swords right here. And races like the elves or the half elves, my next recommendation, are nice because you're going to get access to, let's go back to the elf, long swords, which can be fun if you want to simply put them in one hand. There's really only like one long sword I can think of that's really going to fit for this build because that's the only one that's a finesse weapon. It's a Falar Luve. But outside of that, um, it's just nice to get access to more weapons. Remember, a monk weapon is any weapon you are proficient in. We're going to focus on daggers and short swords with this build, so don't worry too much. It's just something kind of worth noting. Um, if you went with an elf, though, I would definitely go with a wood elf because then you're going to get increased movement, which is going to couple with your monk's natural increased movement. Same thing with a half elf. Um, I would go with the uh, uh, the wood half elf version. God, that was a terrible haircut because you're going to get that increased movement speed. Our class is going to start off with a monk. We will eventually become a rogue. You can start with rogue first if you want and go down that 
uh, rabbit hole and jump into all that action. But I actually kind of just think it's fun to start with a monk and jump right into the shadow monk role immediately. Now, for your background, I almost always recommend stuff like the Guild Artisan for my quote-unquote min-maxing. But for this specific build, if I'm thinking of a min-max route, I'm going to say Charlatan. And that gives me deception and sleight of hand. But as always, guys, it's a single-player game. Have fun with this. Choose the background that kind of makes your character. Create a little bit of a role play for this character. You know, are, are we a charlatan? Are we a criminal? Are we an entertainer that has become some sort of skullduggery assassin in the shadows? Are we a, a, a noble here, right? Or maybe related to a noble or trying to ply the trade of a noble family? Whatever it is that we can kind of create a thread for our character because remember those backgrounds are going to give us inspirations for re-rolls now again i like charlatan because it gives me mainly sight of hand and i'm going to show you why i like that once we jump into this section because our skill proficiencies we want stealth and the nice thing about wood elf in this specific example is it innately gives us stealth but let me go ahead and just switch to like tiefling there we go um, so if I didn't have stealth innately chosen, I have two skills I can choose. What I like then about charlatan is it's giving me sleight of hand already. You cannot get access to this as a monk outside of your background. So it's nice to have that kind of turned on for yourself. And I'm going to put the points here into uh, stealth as well. For some reason, that's just showing a plus three. It should actually show a plus five. So that way, this character is going to be my stealthy character, but they can also pick locks and disarm traps and pickpocket for me. And I like that. I can do that right out the gate. I don't need to have someone kind of hold over for me until I get to a later portion that I get the rogue online, what I, vet, what I would then get sleight of hand. But outside of that, I would definitely take insight. It's probably one of the best skills because you can completely miss things conversationally if you don't have a high enough insight score and if you then also take charlatan you get a conversational skill in deception and i think that is that kind of fits the character too so i, I like that overall route if you do not choose a background that doesn't give you a conversational skill that's fine it's just worth noting you will not be able to specialize into a conversational skill um, without it another point though on that as a monk you are going to get an ac access to a ton of monk specific dialogue options kind of in the way that paladin does but it, it kind of really helps you push through a lot of dialogue you would otherwise maybe stumble through and i think too if you're a gith monk it's just you get so many cool unique things to, to uh to do conversation that it's very very fun let's now talk about our ability scores so with our ability scores we're going to be focusing on dexterity because that's where the majority of our well it's where our damage is coming from <laughs> and also it's going to help us out with armor class and with initiative and then lastly we're going to get wisdom those are our big two focuses uh, because we are a monk we're going to pull armor class from dexterity as well as wisdom as long as we're not wearing any armor right so that's the big thing there and also wisdom is going to help us out with any of our monk uh you know tomfoolery we're also going to put some points here into constitution for some survivability now this depends also is this going to be your face character your main character the character you are personally playing well then that maybe is why i have our charisma set to 12. if you don't want to have our charisma set to 12 or maybe this is for another character i'd recommend dropping it to 10 and putting that point here into dexterity if it's the character you want to get stuff like the hag's hair on if you're playing an honor mode that might be a little difficult but getting the hag's hair here is crucial if you have 17 decks because that makes it so you only need to put one feats worth of improved ability score into dexterity so it's all going to come down to you and your character i'm going to assume you're going to go for the hag's hair you would go 17 here and have 10 charisma but if you didn't want to and just had a little bit more conversational skills you'd go 12 charisma and then choose improved ability score with dexterity twice which puts you up to 20. we'll talk about that in the feet section but this is probably your best more well-rounded approach with the min maxi approach being 17 decks progression wise for this character it's going to be very straightforward we're going to put our first seven levels here into monk then pivot on over to rogue let's break that down now of course with our second level we'll get a little bit more movement speed with an armor and movement this is what i was saying would stack with being a wood elf or a half elf wood elf whatever the situation is additional key points and then we get our really cool bonus actions that we can use like patient defense step of the wind um dash or disengage Jumping into that third level, we'll now choose our subclass, which will be Way of the Shadows. 
Now, you can do all sorts of crazy things like go into the way of the open hand and respec at seven away of shadows and all that crap. I just don't like doing that. Just too much maintenance for me. But this is going to give me some fun actions. Namely, of course, Shadow Arts hide. So now I can go stealth as a bonus action. This is going to be nice once we have access to the rogue capabilities to stealth and sneak attack things. Shadow Arts pass without trace, which is going to allow me just to have plus 10 to stealth checks. It just does require concentration. Darkness, dark vision, silence, and then lastly, a cantrip of minor illusion so that we can distract things and move around freely. We're going to go ahead and push now into level four, which is going to give us our... Um, slow fall, which gain resistance to falling damage and more key points, but now we get our feats. Let's have a conversation about feetsies. So the big focus here is probably going to be on ability improvement. That's going to be the route to take depending upon how your character's done. Um, my character, I didn't get the hag's hair in this playthrough, but I did go to the mirror in the House of Grief, so I actually have plus two dexterity in the character right now. So I'm going to put these first two points into dexterity. After that, like let's just say, let's assume actually you got the hag's hair and this improved ability score got you to 20 um, dexterity. And I'm saying hag's hair because if you've played the game, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what I'm, if you've not played the game, you don't know what I'm talking about. And that's important because I don't want to spoil things. But if I had the hair, this would put me at 20. And remember, ability improvement, you increase one ability by two or two abilities by one to a max of 20. So this will only be helpful if I don't have that hag hair, right? Because that'll be able to put four points into this across two feats. Instead though, what I would say, what I would tell V would be to go with Savage Attacker. When making melee weapon attacks, you roll your damage twice and use the highest result. Of course, you could go to with Alert. Alert is always gonna be a popular one. Plus five bonus to initiative and can't be surprised. It's always gonna be good. I just kind of like as far as what this build can do damage wise, I like really layering in more damage with Savage Attacker. So it's a personal preference for me. I think most people would probably tell you to go with Alert since it's so strong, but I'm gonna just choose the route that I'm gonna choose here. You can go with other things here like Durable or Lucky or Mobile if you want. Um, there's definitely no, no wrong way to go about that. Um, you could even go here with Dual Wielder since we will be dual wielding. Um, just to get you some additional damage. But we will find out when it comes to the items in this build, this will actually not be 100% useful or two weapon fighting be as a, as a fighting style won't be useful either. And I'll show you why. Well, I'm sorry. This will be useful because it's plus one uh, AC, but I'd rather have the damage. I was talking about the two weapon fighting. Fighting style will not be useful and I'll show why with items. But ability improvement, plus two, and we'll progress on. Into level five here, we have more monk stuff. This is going to give us our bonus attack, which is great, or I'm sorry, our extra attack. And we're also going to get Cloak of Shadows. So wrap yourself in shadows to become invisible if you are obscured. Obscured or obscification is going to be the biggest focus of this build, being obscured in some way, shape, or form. And I'll show you how we can actually move from being obscured to being obscured. We're going to get Stunning Strike 2, which is a great way to open up. But this is just a really cool way to just to straight up stun things. Always lovely with, again, that extra attack. Into level 6, we're going to get key empowered strikes so now your unarmed strikes count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance we don't need to worry about that but we're going to get this shadow step this one is crucial teleport from shadow to shadow afterwards you have advantage on your next melee attack roll i love it it's going to be one of the biggest draws of the build now you could do six levels into monk and six levels into rogue but the reason i don't like doing that is because typically when it comes to rogue after level three, it's just about increasing the damage to sneak attack. And sneak attack only scales on odd numbers of levels. So if we take another level here into Monk, let's just go ahead and do it since we're going to do it anyway for this build. It's going to give us access to this, Stillness of Mind. So if you are charmed or frightened, you automatically cast Stillness of Mind to remove the condition. And we get evasion so that we take less damage from spells. It's just such a better utility to the character than just putting another level into Rogue, which isn't going to help us. Remember, Sneak Attack is going to scale on levels 1, 3, 5, 7, Ad nauseum. So I would prefer to just put the next level here into Monk, get these two real great utility abilities, press Accept, bring us into level 8. But no, it's not. It's the first level of Rogue. So this is now going to give us our Sneak Attack. For our ability scores, if you did not take sleight of hand this is when you can now finally open that door if you so wish but i think it's probably right to put 
both of our points here into um what's this called our proficiencies here our expertise i'm sorry into sleight of hand and stealth now with this character this is my wood elf right my character that's at level 12 so i did not have sleight of hand natively as a part of the character so you can see here how that kind of played itself out if I had had sleight of hand, I'd probably would have put this expertise into either a conversational skill or insight. That's probably my preferred route outside of that if I if I didn't already have uh, one of these wasted. So expertise here inside of hand and stealth, and then whatever extra proficiency into some sort of conversational skill, um, whatever it is. Push that forward. We get into level two rogue. It's going to give us our bonus actions or cunning actions as it were. So hide, dash, and disengage. And then our last level to rogue i'm sorry our last level our third level which gets us assassin now you could definitely go with uh, a thief and get a, a extra bonus action but assassin is the name of the game with this character and the biggest focus here is getting stuff like an assassinate initiative you are deadliest against unprepared enemies in combat you have advantage on attack rolls against creatures that haven't taken a turn yet which goes well with this any successful attack against a surprise creature is a critical hit. And lastly, Assassin's Alacrity. Whenever you start combat, you immediately restore your action and bonus actions at the start of combat. So basically what this allows you to do is use your actions, bonus actions to sneak around, get into a point, surprise something, or just whenever you start combat, doesn't need to be surprised. That's going to get you the crit hits, obviously. But um, jumping into combat immediately is going to reset your action and bonus action. So you can kind of uh, uh, prep stuff a little bit better going to jump another level here it's just going to give us another feat and like i said if you have ability improvement up to 20 it's not it's going to be wasted here so we're going to go with savage attacker and there we go and our last level into rogue is going to also give us uncanny dodge so lightning reflections to protect yourself when an attack hits you you only take half the usual damage that's a huge bit of survivability that's going to happen at at, from level 11 into 12 right but level 12 can actually happen early in act three this gives you a lot of survivability for a lot of the toughest fights you're going to experience throughout that third act and i don't think sneak attack is on or is in this thing no it's not it's only going to be in my or we'll just press accept here because now at level five we have a sneak attack that is going to do a substantial bit of damage with 3d6 whereas before if we had if we had jumped up to level six with this it would still be 1d6 plus 3d6 so you can see that the benefit here wouldn't be huge but if we jumped to level seven of, of rogue that would have been a 4d6 let's now put all this together and talk more so putting this all together what can we do how can we have some fun as this shadow monk combination with rogue well mainly we have a ton of bonus action stuff that we can take advantage of with patient defense I'm sorry, with patient defense, with shadow, um, with step of the wind dash, step of the wind disengage. We have our hides. We've got disengage and dash. Tons of ways we can move around the map using those bonus actions. We also get our really cool capability here to cloak of shadows, which is just a free invisibility that we can use. You'll notice though, when you take a look at this, it doesn't have a recycle, right? It doesn't say, hey, this is a per short rest or anything like that. So I do like that. Of course, the caveat is you just have to be slightly obscured in order to even be able to use it. But the biggest thing and the biggest draw and the biggest focus and all the big things I'm going to say right now, it's all about this right here, Shadow Step. Teleport from shadow to shadow. Afterwards, you have advantage on your next melee attack roll. Two things. This is, does not have a reset as well. You know, hey, you have to short or long rest, and it doesn't cost key, which a lot of things within the uh, monk repertoire do. So if I click this ability, well, i got to be within... There we go. We can jump all the way. Here, let's just go right there. Maybe. Work. There we go. And it's kind of tricky, right? Because like, you kind of have to see, you hold down this button and you can see, okay, that's got a half moon or a, a half sun. I know it's slightly obscured, right? That's not lightly obscured, right? Or if I go over here, somewhere in here, this will be no sun at all, meaning that it'll be heavily obscured. My point is, I pretty much am just going to teleport from shadow to shadow within a pretty large range here. Like I have a pretty good radius to jump to. And it's great. I just keep doing it. I can do it as many times in combat as I want because all it costs me is a bonus action. And I've got plenty of things I can do with that bonus action, of course, but I can also teleport around the map. And this kind of makes me a really cool little like ninja that's going to jump around and do my attacks. Keep in mind, too, that when that's up, Right now, advantage on its next melee attack roll. So you can set yourself up for a really good, strong hit. And keep in mind, too, sneak attack. You don't need to be stealthing. 
sneak attack, you deal extra damage to a foe you have advantage against. So if you were to use your bonus action to shadow step behind someone, you could then use your sneak attack without any repercussions. You just go ahead and do it. So that's kind of why this character is this really cool kind of ninja assassin character and how we can lean into all these things. And on top of it, we can do a bunch of stunning melee. Or if we want, we can use situations where we use flurry of blows, which will not use our weapons. It will use our fists, but our fists are A, magical because we're a monk, and B, they're still going to do quite a bit of damage. It's still 12 to 22 damage versus my, oops, versus my melee attack is 8 to 13. So you still get plenty of damage coming out of a flurry of blows. As far as gear goes, let's talk about the items that I don't have. Starting, of course, with the Knife of the Under Mountain King. This is a real amazing short sword you're going to get in the Mountain Pass of Act 1, and it's going to help increase your um, crit strikes from, or crits, from 20 down to 19. It just reduces that number by 1, and that's a stacking thing, of course. Also, with Shadow Blade, you have advantage on attack rolls against lightly or heavily obscure targets when using this blade, which you'll probably be jumping into since you'll be able to shadow step behind things or around near things that are already in that kind of lightly or heavily obscured kind of situation. So this gives you advantage where your shadow step will also give you advantage, both of which will help out with sneak attacks. Another big one is going to be the Death Stalker Mantle if you are going with a Dark Urge playthrough. If you don't have a Dark Urge playthrough, this won't matter to you. But whenever you kill someone... You shroud yourself in primeval darkness to become invisible for two turns. So basically, you can just kind of jump in and out of the shadows, kill things, and immediately go right back into being invisible, which is huge. Now, another thing here, too, is the Hat of Uninhibited Kushigo. I would just, in general, recommend the, uninhi the um, yeah, Uninhibited Kushigo armor set. You'll get the majority of it throughout Act 1 um, in Grimforge, throughout portions of the game, and then right at the beginning of Act 2. That's kind of everything kind of culminating. The Hat of Unhibited Kushigo for the Quartermaster in Act 2 at the, um, at the end. But this is nice here because it just increases your AC bonus by 1 every time you deal damage with an unarmed attack or a monk weapon. So it's great. Just a free little bonus to your spell save DC at the end of their turn. So a nice little bonus right there. And then the last one is the Graceful Cloth, which you'll probably be using until you get the Uninhibited Kushigo or maybe even in lieu of it. But this will help increase your deck score by two with a max of 20. So keep that in mind, right? This will really only help, help you until you get up to 20 decks. Beyond that, it's not going to push you past. So if you have, if you get, say, the Hag's Hair, you're at 18. This will set you up to 20. Then once you get the improved ability score, you could swap this out. But what I do also like about this is you gain a plus one bonus to dexterity saving throws and increase your jump distance by 1.5 meter, but you also get Cat's Grace. So you have advantage on decks. So anytime you want to do any kind of uh, sleight of hand tomfoolery, you're just going to get that natural uh, advantage on doing any of that sleight of hand action that you'll need to do with this build. Now, as far as the items that I do have, let's go through the list of them. We'll start with weapons. So throughout the game, just find any kind of dagger or short sword that works for you. I'm going to point out some pretty good ones or a long sword here and there. But for the most part, you'll just kind of find anything that's going to help you. Even if it's a plus one dagger, just use that. But we've got stuff like Dolar Amaris here, which is, I don't know how to pronounce that. When you land a crit hit with this weapon, it deals an additional seven damage. And it's a plus two weapon enchantment. You'll get this in Act 3, so it might kind of fall off in its usefulness pretty quickly. But the Falara Luve is a really great finesse longsword that you can use that can help you out with debuffing your foe or buffing yourself. You can get the Sword of Life Stealing in the beginning of Act 2. On a crit hit, the target takes an extra 10 necrotic damage as long as it isn't a construct or undead. And you also just get a free 10 temp hit points. So it's a nice little bit of survivability. It's a really good short sword for a pretty good chunk of the game too. But you'll also get the Stillmaker at the beginning of Act 1, or uh, ooh, 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 beginning of Act 3. And this gives you a free cast of Hold Person, which can be really cool because Hold Person will give you auto crits on anything within 10 feet, which you will be if you're killing something. So being able to use Hold Person on something is a very nice capability. Some other things that are not necessarily great for the build, but they exist, are the are this Belm. Now, Belm is a scimitar. So unless you have specialization of this, you'll, you'll get it through Rogue. But my point is, if you don't have the specialization, it's not going to be too huge. But it will give you a better kind of offhand attack with perfectly balanced strike. 
And lastly, we have the Duelist Prerogative. This is a good one if you just don't have any good weapons. If you're like, hey, I'm an Act 3, I'm kind of spelunking through stuff, I've got this crap-ass offhand weapon, use this until you get the first two, that, the, the next two that we're going to talk about. Because this is great, because it gives you that bonus to uh, your crit hit, um, your critical hit, your crit. Uh, but also you get an additional reaction per turn, and you can do necrotic damage, and you get Dueler's Enthusiasm, which is just a free bonus action attack, and you get challenged to a duel. So a lot of really cool things that you can do here. Now the big focus items, you're going to pretty much use that Sword of the Undermountain King in this build with Bloodthirst. Bloodthirst is going to be the best weapon that you can use. The number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one. So between just those two items, both the Sword of the Undermountain King or whatever the hell it is, the, the in the hall of the, the Mountain King, and this weapon, you'll crit hit on 18s, 19s, and 20s, right? But you also get main hand only exploit weakness. Creatures hit with this weapon receive vulnerability to piercing damage. That is juicy. And you can swap out that Undermountain King with the Crimson Mischief. You'll get both of these from the same individual in Act 3. You get Prey Upon the Weak, so you just do an extra 1 to 4 piercing against targets with 50% of their hits or less. That's whatever. But the offhand here is what's nice. When you make an attack with your offhand weapon, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack. So this is just as if you had two weapon fighting, which is a really cool combination here. They work so well together. And there's another weapon, another item in this build that is going to lean into the damage profile of both of these. So just keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But now starting from the head down, let's go into the armor. Starting with the head, of course, with that uh, the gear breakdown, we're going to go to the Covert Cowl. This is nice because while obscure, the number you need to roll a critical hit is reduced by one again. So that is 17, 18, 19, 22 critical hit. That's going to be... In Proved further with the Shade Flare Cloak, so it's 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. The problem with this helmet is light armor. So if you get it, it'll be okay. You're just not going to get the benefit of your wisdom into your armor class. And it is also worth noting is you won't get access to stuff like your unarmored movement, stuff like that. So if you wear this, just know that it's going to shut those things off. I have it here because it looks really cool for the build. The best in slot is probably the Soul, the Mask of Soul Perception. Plus two bonus to attack rolls, initiative rolls, and perception checks. All are very good across the board. There are other helmets that can help out with crit, but I think this is ultimately what you're going to land on. You can go with the Hell Dusk helmet if you want to. This is not an armor piece, which is nice. Uh, it can prevent you from getting blinded. You can't get crit hitted, and you have a plus two bonus to saving throws against spells. So more of a defensive item. Uh, the Shadow of Menzo Barons on is another really cool one if you want a thematic helmet. It's just another stealth. For our cloaks, I just showed off the Shade Slayer cloak, but you've got this. Also, you can go with like the Cloak of Protection protection for some armor class, the Cloak of Cunning Broom, which I like. It's a very early access um, item in the game, which will give you a foggy cloud with a 7-foot radius whenever you disengage. And disengage can be a bonus action, and this will put you into being lightly obscured. So it's very nice to be able to do that. I have the Cloak of the Weave here, but I meant to get the cloak that just does elemental absorption as a defensive one. So it's just there to, to show off another cloak. For our boots, we're going to be using the Disintegrating Night Stalker so we can't be unwebbed, entangled, and snared, and just have Misty Step. Even though we already have Shadow Step, it could be nice that you're in a situation where you, maybe you just don't have any lightly obscured locations around you. You can Misty Step to a location that then allows you to go from there. But other just early ones that you'll get access to are stuff like the Boots of Speed. Just go with any kind of mobility boots. You could even use the Boots of Uninhibited Kushigo. The wearer deals additional damage equal to their Wisdom modifier with unarmed strikes. Now you're thinking, dude, we're using weapons. But like I said, Flurry of Blows is not. So this will help add damage to Flurry of Blows. I think it reflects it in the tooltip. It does. So Flurry of Blows is now 18 to 28 versus... 12 to 22. So you can see how it will still help out the character. You can also go with something like a Bone Spike Boots, which I actually very much like, and I'm kind of in a toss-up between this and the Disintegrating Night Stalkers. So if you need the Night Stalkers on another build, use these instead. You have a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws as long as you're not wearing armor. So that puts this character up to 21 AC, which is always a, a nice feeling. Now, for our chest armor, like I said, go with the armor of uninhibited Kushigo, the graceful cloth. You could even use this one, which is pretty cool. It's just, keep in mind, it's light armor. So you want to stay away from light armor if you can help it, but this at least helps you out in a lot of stealth capabilities. It's there if you need it. But you're ultimately going to fall in the vest of soul rejuvenation because it's just so goddamn strong. 
Yeah, whenever the wearer succeeds, blah, yeah, cool, healing. The greater Kushigo counter is disgusting. The wearer can use a reaction to make an unarmed strike against any attacker that misses. This plays a role with our uh, boots of uninhibited Kushigo, right? So now we're just do, you just get a free reaction hit onto someone. So it's a nice bit of damage you're going to be able to do. And it's, it's just a nice piece of uh, chest armor. It looks cool as hell too. For our gloves, we have lots of options. You can go with the Hell Dust gloves if you want some spell save DC and spell attack rolls. I mean, that's that's not really huge, right? Because we're not doing that. But weapon attacks deal additional one to six fire damage, which is really cool. And you get rays of fire. You can go with the gloves of missile snaring early in the game. You get these in Act One until you, as a monk, get access to your native missile snaring capabilities. Remember, you can do that right here: deflect missile and then eventually reflect the missile back to them. Braces of defense is another release early set of gloves that are great. The Gloves of Soul Catching are, are Act 3 gloves that you'll get. These are nice. They add that unarmed damage to the character that is forced. So if you do do your reaction, you're going to do that. You use your Furia Blows. You're getting 1 to 10 force damage, which is cool. But the cool thing about this is you can, once per turn on an armed hit, you can regain 10 hit points. Alternatively, you can forego healing to gain advantage on attack rolls and saving throws, and it gives you plus 2 con. So you can just not use the healing of this and get advantage on attack rolls, which turns on your sneak attacks. Boom. That's a pretty cool capability, and it's a once per turn, not a per short rest or any of that other jargon. Another really good set is the Legacy of the Masters, just a straight plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls. Always lovely. Keep in mind, it's medium armor, so actually don't use those. I thought those were not medium armor. <laughs> that's a mess up in the whole entire video. Let's just keep moving on like I didn't do that. Stalker Gloves, you gain a plus one bonus to initiative rolls, and I like this a lot because your sneak attack deals an additional one to four force damage. You might be thinking, that sucks. Who cares? Well, if your sneak attack crits, so does that value. Anytime something uh, crits, any additive bonuses, like let's say you've got the ring that does the um, acid damage every time a, a, a weapon hits, well, that crits. All of it crits. All of it doubles. So this goes from 1 to 4 force damage to 2 to 8. And remember, force is one of the least resisted damage types in the game. But we are going to rely upon the Bone Spike gloves because your attacks ignore resistance to slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning damage. Your attacks... All of your attacks, your unarmed things are bludgeoning. So if something's resistant to it, doesn't matter. You can hit with full damage. And the best thing about this is this couples with that bloodthirst. Creatures hit with this weapon receive vulnerability to piercing and you ignore their resistance to piercing. I don't know what the orientation is. Like, hey, if you do vulnerability and they've got resistance, it still does like it negates itself. I don't know if that exists, but either way, you just ignore all of it. So... Those, these two things in tandem work so well together. We already went through our boots. Uh, let's go into our jewelry. And, oh, here we go. This is a pretty good uh, necklace here. While wearing Khaled's Gift, Jahira cannot be cursed. So that's good for Jahira. But you just get plus one wisdom and you get a free cast of aid. So if you have 18 or 17 wisdom, this gets you up to 18 wisdom, which is quite nice in addition to that too i didn't showcase it but the surgeon's amulet from act two is a really is probably the best in slot outside of the next one because it allows you to do a once per rest i remember it's longer short it allows you to paralyze someone so there there's that great capability but i like the amulet ooh, the, here the sentient amulet because this gives me shatter and key restoration so i can do more of my key abilities it's probably going to help you out the most and also of course shield this Amulet of the Harpers just gives you a free cast of shield. So if you're in a dire straits, this is a great defensive one. So I think you really can't go wrong with any of these three or the fourth one that I did mention. Um, and Jewelry, Killer Sweetheart's going to be obvious here. When you kill a creature, your next roll will be a critical hit. Um, also, Ring of Free Actions, you ignore the effects of difficult terrain and cannot be paralyzed. And lastly, stuff like Crusher's Ring is really helpful here. There's a ring that helps out and gives you always advantage on attacks, but disadvantages on saves. You can go with that ring if you want. It's kind of risky, but... It's called the Risky Ring. Um, but those are some examples of really good best in slot items here. And definitely want to make sure you use the dead shot because this will further reduce your uh, crit hits by one, right? So if we're adding everything up, that's one, two, three. Well, not this one, but the 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 knife of the Undermountain King. So this one plus the knife of the Undermountain King plus this one. Now we're critical hitting on a 17, plus this is critical hitting on a 16 so that's real great across the board let's now show off what this build can do so jumping in to show off some of this gameplay let's talk about what we can really do with this this character now you can jump in and just kind of throw fisticuffs but 
Keep in mind, this is one of the ones that can really abuse greater invisibility. Turn a creature invisible, attacks against it at disadvantage, it attacks with advantage. Visit invisibility breaks when you fail increasingly harder stealth techs, checks on attacking, casting spells, or interacting with items versus invisibility, which just breaks that, right? So here's an example. Visibility ends early if you attack, cast on a spell, take an action, or take damage. So you do harder and harder and harder stealth checks, and you can try to avoid it as much as you can and stay stealth and while you have advantage. So that is a way that you could approach this character. Keep that in mind. I think a lot of people would even recommend you to approach it that way. But we can even just open up this fight by doing a little bit of this. So we could jump over here. Use Shadow Step. And we can go, I just did Shadow Step real quick, but that would, ah, God damn, ah. <laughs> we'll do this. Uh, speed, Potion of Speed. We'll quaff one of these. We'll Shadow Step right here. We'll sneak attack like that. And we'll skip that. And there we go. We triggered this and attack before our potion of speed wears off. There we go. So if you're wondering why I've got two primary actions, it's because of that. And you can see here what we did. We just did 24 piercing damage from that. Unfortunately, we didn't critical hit. But the cool thing is we got all of our abilities back, right? Because we're an assassin. All of our actions and bonus actions have returned to the table. We can have some fun here. I can go for a stun. We can go for whatever action. Let's just go ahead and do this again. We'll just, we'll, we'll force the crit. And that's 72 juicy damage in what they call the fucking face. Holy crap. So you can see, because we made them vulnerable with the weapon, it just slices and dices. Now, of course, we can't keep doing sneak attacks, but we can still do main hand attacks. And here, we'll just do another crit. Boom, boom. Okay, so that is just great, right? So we did 17 damage there. We did another 24 damage there. I didn't mean to turn on the uh, dual wielding, unfortunately, but it's there. So regardless, we have still another attack because of our uh, potion of speed. So we can go ahead and do this. And we've killed them. But you know what? Hey, we're kind of... That's kind of a rough and tumble situation, man. Well... Now we've cloaked the shadows out of that. That, that cost us an action, right? I could have gone ahead and done more damage over here. I can run around over here and we're still we're stealthed so let's just go ahead and end the turn they're over there hiding those cowards now i did not expect him to do that and i'm good to just go ahead and I'm going to get lethargic from my, my potion of speed. But we'll wait for that to... There we go. Boom. Again, right into it. And see how that's just jumping right into it? Let's take that, that uh, sneak attack off. I'm sorry, that, that dueled off. Aura of Murder is up. Going to use this. Boom. 72 damage yet again. We'll come over to this character. And the best thing is we're still obscured, so we can have as much fun with that as we want. And we did that. And I could have gone ahead and shadow stepped to the character, which probably would have been the better idea. But I can't tell you that I'm a smart person. I'm not. Uh, but watch this. We'll just do it over here. Watch that doesn't impose a uh, opportunity attack. So I can just go ahead and chain this over to here. Or I could have done a sneak attack or a stunning strike right there. So you can see that there's a lot of mobility built into this build. And the build, yeah, sure, I can use all these step of the winds and disengages and all of these cunning actions, but I can just simply shadow step out of all of it and it costs the same amount as it would cost for any of these other things, right? Bonus action, bonus action, bonus action, bonus, bonus, bonus. That's what I'm gonna do the Mario theme, bonus, bonus, bonus. Then this just allows me to do a shadow step instead. I could open up my turn with a shadow step instead and simply allow myself to do another a big attack roll uh, on the primary action or in that situation again i could have just simply cloaked of shadows and ran away 
You are so mobile, it is so fun, and you can just do so much stuff with this build. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy being a ninja in the game, in the world of Baldur's Gate 3. But go ahead and let me know how you maybe would approach this differently, what items you might use, or maybe you have a really cool ninja build and it doesn't even use Shadow Monk. It uses like Assassin and Gloomstalker and you take a different route, whatever it is. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. I always appreciate the feedback and things that people would approach these games in a different way. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.